Uh, just for a moment, can you stop sharing the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, yeah. Uh, we are online already, so welcome to our next session of uh, Eurasia Talks. And to, today, as usually, we have a, a great guest and great topic. And to present uh, our, our today's as uh, our today's topic, I would like to give uh, the microphone for Ishik Kuschubonfod, who is our uh, co-host of Eurasia Talks. So please, Ishik Kuschubonfod, the floor is yours. Um, hi everyone. Um, today we have the honor to uh, host um, Professor Horace Saltis of uh, University of um, Nicosia and uh, University of Cyprus. Sorry, um, Horace uh, is a, is an associate professor of social and developmental psychology at the University of Cyprus, and he studied at the. Pedagogical Academy of Cyprus and at the University of Cyprus and at Pantheon University of Athens. He followed his graduate studies at the University of Cambridge, also worked as a postdoc researcher at the Oxford Center for the Study of Intergroup Conflict, Department of Experimental Psychology, University of Oxford. He has extensive um, publications on um, the issue. Uh, and um, I guess uh, we're all uh, here uh, for, um, you know, um, we kind of all are interested in uh, the conflict, which has been a conflict uh, for some decades and um, unfortunately a frozen one. Um, the political aspects of the conflict are um, known to us uh, as well. Uh, yet today, I think uh, a more important aspect of uh, how people uh, went through or going through both sides of the island, uh, Turks and um, or Turkish and Greek Cypriots are uh, going through the uh, conflict. Went through the conflict. What are their or what have been their traumas, uh, frustrations, and um, what is their expectations about the future. Uh, so more human aspects uh, will be uh, our topic today, um, which is very, I think, important for any future uh, solution to the conflict. So I now uh, give the floor to uh, uh, Professor Saltis. Uh, please, the floor is yours, Harris. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Ishik, uh, first of all, I want to thank you and Yulia for the invitation. And um, I think it's the second time that I give a talk in a, in a university in Turkey, which is very good. Previous time it was in Kadir Khas, and we discussed similar issues. Um, but it's always great to have the opportunity to present some of the views of uh, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots to an audience in Turkey, given that um, Turkey's role in, in the Cyprus issue uh, is big, and uh, I'm sure we, all, we are all interested as Cypriots ourselves to see how um, Turkey can also contribute to the solution of the problem. So I would be very much uh, open to a discussion uh, on any ideas. So I, I would like to share my view. Um, Is it okay? Can everybody see? Yeah, I think it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me start. Mm -hmm. So um, the study of the Cyprus issue in Cyprus um, has been traditionally being uh, given thought by anthropologists, uh, people working in politics, sociology, history, education, international relations, but the social psychological view, it's only a recent one, uh, with the first uh, published research only appearing around 2007. And the opportunity for that came um, with the first generation of social psychologists that started working in universities in Cyprus, in both communities. And the opening of the checkpoints uh, that made possible this kind of research that I will be presenting today, which is by communal, because as you probably all know, 
uh, up to 2003, uh, the checkpoints in the middle of Cyprus uh, were closed and so people could not actually communicate or visit each other. So uh, this uh, historical turning point made possible also uh, by communal research, which we find very interesting because it's one of the few opportunities we have to understand the views uh, of the other community. And uh, given that um, the linguistic differences in Cyprus, that the two communities talk a different language, and that we are in a way raised in division and in two different educational systems. So to start um, a short narrative, I don't want to go into the history of the Cyprus issue, but as we all know, we had the events of bicommunal strife in 63 and 64, and then we had the events of 1974, and all these events uh, led to, as we say, uh, both direct and indirect forms of victimization. And what I have here is just to give a broad overview of, of the extent of the victimization that took place in both communities of Cyprus. So this is just uh, statistical data from my representative sample survey of our own lab that was conducted in 2007. And what you can see here is that about one third in each community uh, became internally displaced people, lost their house. Um, around 5% uh, suffered some physical injuries. Uh, about 3 to 5% uh, became prisoners of war. Um, the extended notion of displacement is much wider, as you can see, because when you ask people whether a close friend or a member of their family became refugee or internally displaced, then you have a 65% in the Greek Cypriot community and a 38% in the Turkish Cypriot community. Whether a family member or close friend has been physically injured, then again, you have a bigger percentage, 25% and 34 in the Turkish Cypriot community. Has a member of your family been taken prisoner? Around one third in each community. Did any member of your family go missing? Around one fourth in each community. And has a member of your family been killed? 20% uh, in the Greek Cypriot community and 30% in the Turkish Cypriot community. So the picture here is very comparable in the two communities. And I give this as a background because we are all familiar with the um, discourse that sometimes appears in, in especially nationalist discourse that the people who have been traumatized uh, are the most difficult to change uh, in a process of conflict transformation. And actually, this has been one of the main um, questions that we try to explore with Ishik and other colleagues like Neofitos Gloizidis at the University of Kent very recently, when we tried to look at the views of internally displaced people about the other community and about their readiness to uh, reach a compromise uh, to support a solution to the Cyprus problem. And surprisingly for some people, we found actually that the people who are internally displaced, uh, and in fact, in both communities, uh, they show uh, more readiness to support a compromise solution. So in that sense, uh, this is important to know because uh, sometimes you hear the nationalistic argument that uh, you're asking me to, you know, to reconciliate or with other people and why don't you ask uh, internally displaced people who lost their property? Do they want that, for example? And actually what we find here is exactly the, the opposite, that people who have lost properties are actually more ready to uh, go for a solution. Now, as a social psychologist, um, I'm interested in what we call the um, social representations of the conflict. And as you can understand this, uh, representations of the conflict are uh, very much related to the way we represent the past and the history of the Cyprus problem. And when we talk about representations of the past, we are referring to a process that is formed by the way history is taught in schools 
by the way we um, political discourse is formulated around the past and uh, of course through tv series and movies uh, which refer to past events um, so I will talk a bit about that because that's another of the main focus of my own research, uh, how representations of the past relate to the way we view the other community today and how we view the future in, in a sense, whether we want to see a solution to the problem on, on a compromise, on the basis of a compromise or whether we take a maximalist position. And, and as you can see here, we usually use the iceberg metaphor which was used also by my ex uh, late supervisor, late Gerald Duvin, who was talking about social representations that sometimes form uh, the notion of an iceberg. So you see somebody expressing a view. So in the case of Cyprus, uh, you might find the peoples uh, talking about their national identity, for example, and they might say, um, I'm a Cypriot. Some other people might say I'm, I'm Greek. Uh, so there is this tension in allegiances about whether people feel more Cypriot or Greek in the Greek Cypriot community and in the Turkish Cypriot community, whether they feel more Cypriot or Turkish. And we call this Cypriocentric or uh, Greek centric or Turkocentric orientations. Uh, but below that kind of uh, label or identification, it's always important to know that you can find a, a hidden uh, um, layer of beliefs that support this kind of use. And um, sometimes this hidden layer of use is actually much more difficult to change and hence the use of the iceberg metaphor because in a frozen conflict, these uh, beliefs tend to become ossified and sometimes very difficult to change. And when you go into the details of the structure of these representations, you will see uh, stereotypes, uh, attitudes, um, whether people are ready to see the perspective of the other community or not, whether they feel threatened. And in social psychology, we talk about realistic and symbolic threats or group esteem threat, which is the feeling that the members of the other community look down upon our own community. Intergroup anxiety, which is um, the sense in which you feel uncomfortable coming into contact with members of the other community. Uh, distrust, which is of course has a central role to play because without trust, it's very difficult to collaborate with other member, members of the other group and see a future of a compromise on the Cyprus issue. And all these are somehow um, organized, if we can use the, the metaphor of the organizing principle, around narratives of history. And in the case of Cyprus, um, one can wonder what is the role of these representations of the past in forming the structure of intergroup relations today? And we have a very good answer to this. Um, by the study of a colleague here in the University of Cyprus, Yanis Papadagis, who wrote about the way history textbooks um, cover and represent the history of Cyprus. And you can see here very clearly that the educational system has formed uh, two clearly opposite views and representations of what happened in Cyprus. So in the case of Greek Cypriots, you have the master historical narrative uh, that uh, the history of Cyprus starts with the arrival of Greeks in 14th century BC that led to the Hellenization of the island. Here the moral center is Greeks of Cyprus and the major enemies Turks. The broad consensus struggle for survival by Cypriot Hellenism against foreign conquerors and the tragic end is the barbaric Turkish invasion, that's how it's presented in the textbooks and occupation of 37% of Cyprus. When you go to the Turkish Cypriot uh, narrative of textbook narrative, you see that the master historical narrative is one that begins with the arrival of Turks in Cyprus in 1571, a Anno Domini. The moral self is Turks of Cyprus and the major enemy are Rooms, that, that is Greek Cypriots. The plot concerns the struggle for survival by the Turks of Cyprus against 
Greek Cypriot domination. The war of 1974 marks a happy ending with the so-called happy peace operation by Turkey in Cyprus, which saved Turkish Cypriots from a pending union of Cyprus uh, with Greece. So you can see here completely different interpretations of what happened in uh, 1974. Um, whether um, there is a sense of ownership here, and this is very important because uh, when a group of people feel that the ownership of the land is exclusively theirs, then they there is no symbolic space to accept the other community, and this is really a problem because it creates exclusionary identities and um, hardens the positions in a way that make compromise very difficult. So just to uh, give you an example here, and I see my colleague Martin Barrett, who has worked a lot on how prejudice develops in children, in childhood. So I, I guess he will be very much interested in that. This is from the study of Harama Kriyani, who interviewed uh, Greek Cypriot children uh, of fourth graders. So that's nine to 10 year olds. And just ask them to write a short history of Cyprus. And you can see here how children internalized the history of Cyprus. And so I will re read just two paragraphs here, three paragraphs. For example, um, my homeland is Cyprus. Cyprus is 8,000 years old. Its capital is Nicosia. The mother homeland is Greece. And we are Greek Cypriots. In 1974, there was an invasion by the Turks and we were conquered. Some people are now refugees and they long for their villages. Another narrative, my homeland is Cyprus. Various people came and conquered us. The last enemies were the Turks. They made work against us and took half of Cyprus. So you can see here very clearly that it's a very simplified view of victimization. And it is also a one-sided victimization because obviously from these narratives, uh, the Turkish Cypriot view is completely excluded. And it's like the Cyprus issue started in 1974 without recognition of the fact that there was intercommunal strife in the year 63, 64. And that there was even before that the struggle of Greek Cypriots for union of Cyprus with Greece. So you can see this one sided perspective that we know from social psychology, it creates a feeling of competitive victimhood that we are the only victims or that we are more victims than the other group. And this is always related with more prejudice and distrust towards uh, the other community. So talking about um, social representations, uh, I think it's also important here to um, present uh, if you like to map the field of social representations of the problem. And I will present first the Greek Cypriot point of view and then the Turkish Cypriot point of view. And as you will see, it is not a, a uniform point of view. Um, you know, usually in nationalism, we have uh, a narrative that tries to create a uniform idea of the outgroup. Uh, but actually, if you study, you will always find that you have the master narrative, which has this hegemonic view that wants to somehow become widespread and dominant, but actually you always have the critical narrative. And the critical narrative in Cyprus is usually related to a political and a political ideology of the left that always stresses the importance of cooperation between the two communities and the idea of a more Cypriocentric view of Cyprus that, you know, as a national identity, we are more Cypriots than both Greeks and Turks. So in that sense, you can see here um, an analysis that uses the so-called two-step cluster analysis. Uh, it's based on a questionnaire study. And what it does is that we measure the level of contact people have with members of the other community. We measure their feelings towards the other community. We measure the level of forgiveness about uh, wrongs of the past. We measure identification, whether they feel more Cypriot or Greek. And in the case of Turkish Cypriots, 
whether they feel more Turkish than uh, Cypriot. We measure threats, the feeling of realistic and symbolic threats, and trust. So two-step cluster analysis creates profiles <coughs> um, within each community. And what you see here is three distinct profiles in the Greek Cypriot community. And the first profile is very clearly one which is pro-reconciliation, because you can see here that people have more contact, so they are more cooperative. They usually work in NGOs that promote uh, relationships and cooperation between the two communities. You can see that they can see the perspective of the other community, that they have more positive feelings, um, and that in terms of identification, they tend to stress being Cypriot than um, the motherland identif identification. If you move on the right-hand side, C3, the third one, is the traditional nationalistic position where uh, in the case of Greek Cypriots, um, is the people who feel very close allegiance with Greece, and that they might still be, you know, um, have the ideal, I would not say Enosis union today, because it's only very marginal today. We find from research that it only expresses around 5% uh, of the population, but still, it's the continuation of that line of thinking of Greek nationalism, because you see that they are they feel usually more Greek than Cypriot. At least that's uh, an increased percentage of the people who feel like that, even if it's not the majority view. And there is a lower, uh, significantly lower sense of three Cypriot centuries. Here you find lower levels of trust for the other community and a difficulty in understanding the perspective of the other community. Now, the interesting um, contribution of our research here is that it went beyond this traditional, you know, the, the pro-reconciliation and the nationalist bipolarity by identifying a third position, which I would say is the result uh, of living in separation for so many years. Uh, I use the idea of uh, from Billing banal nationalism. It's a kind of mundane nationalism in the sense that people have been living for so many years in separation. So they are they created a moral horizon which is not inclusive of the other community because their everyday life does not involve relationships with the other community. So they are not necessarily nationalists. They are not necessarily feeling, you know, um, hate for the other community because you find here that you might even find positive feelings for the other community or moderate feelings for the other community but they don't have contact with the other community and that uh, does not allow them to create these friendships and relationships with the other community in the case of turkey cypriots it's very interesting because we found exactly the same structure so you find the first position, with, which is the pro-reconciliation position, again, with similar structural characteristics. You have the third position, which is the ethno-nationalist with closer adherence to Turkey um, as you know, being part of the Turkish nation in a way. And you have, again, in the middle position, this more um, banal nationalist position, which is in the case of Turkish Cypriots, I would say, is a position of communitarian autonomy. So it keeps an equal distance from both Greek Cypriots and Turkey at the same time. And um, again, these people have lower levels of contact with other community. So in that sense, their ethical horizon, again, is not inclusive of the other community. And it's important to understand that uh, with the passing years, which kind of positions become strengthened in Cyprus and which becomes weaker, okay? And what um, our research has shown is that the pro-reconciliation uh, position is becoming stronger because of the opening of the checkpoints and that people keep having contact, which reduces prejudice, which builds trust. Uh, 
but on the contrary, the third position, the ethno-nationalist, is becoming weaker year every year. And the reason for that is that we go away from the notion for Greek Cypriots of uh, enosis. Um, and uh, we see in uh, Turkish Cypriots um, a growing reaction also towards the effort um, of Turkey to build more mosques, uh, to make of them more religious, uh, Muslims, and, and as we know, you know, Turkish Cypriots are considered one of the most secular community, uh, religious community, Muslim community in the world. So in that sense, uh, we see a trend of more Cypriocentric orientations, which is not going along with the effort um, to, you know, to teach them the Quran, you know, or to make them more Muslims as, as they are now. So in that sense, uh, there is an interesting uh, internal division in both communities. And it's important to stress this and understand this because we need to go beyond this nationalistic stereotype that the other community thinks all of them think exactly in the same way. So talking about this changing Cypriocentric orientation, you can see it here. Uh, we have some data. So I feel uh, Cypriot first and then Greek. You see here in Greek Cypriots, there was a slight decrease, but in Turkish Cypriots, there was a significant increase. And actually, if I, want, if I was to add here the data from 2020, uh, you would see that in both communities, this percentage has become much higher now. Um, I will show some of that later on, actually. Then uh, we have some questions uh, concerning, I feel that I can live with the, the other community. And in the Greek Cypriot community, it was about half uh, in the year 2007 and 2017. In the Turkish Cypriot community, it was lower, but there was a significant increase. I trust Turkish Cypriot and Greek Cypriot when they say they love Cyprus, but this is trust trusting the other community we see a significant increase in trust in both communities. Um, I don't have the time to go through all of them, but uh, I'm just showing, you know, in some indicative um, findings here. This is about identity again. You see here, we have this classical Moreno question when we ask people whether they feel uh, only Cypriot and not Greek, more Cypriot than Greek, to the same extent Greek and Cypriot, more Greek than Cypriot, only Greek and not Cypriot. And what is interesting here is uh, this finding that deconstructed a lot of stereotypes actually in Cyprus, because you can see here that only 1% feel more Greek than Cypriot. And, uh, sorry, only Greek and not Cypriot, only 1%. And more Greek than Cypriot, only five to six percent. So the majority actually feel to the same extent Greek and Cypriot. And there is this percentage of people here, which is around 35 to 40 percent, which they feel more Cypriot than Greek. And if we go to the Turkish Cypriot corresponding table here, you see that uh, again, there are similar findings, only Turkish and not Cypriot, only around 6% and with a downward trend, more Turkish than Cypriot, around 7% with a downward trend again. Um, the majority again here, they feel to the same extent Turkish and Cypriot. And there is an increasing trend if you see here, especially the last year, uh, about one third, um, sorry, 27%, that they feel more Cypriot than Turkish. So these are important, why? Because they correlate with some of our other variables about prejudice, distrust, and because we know that the identities are very important, whether they take the form of inclusive or exclusive identities. And that's something we can discuss more, more if you like. Now, if we go into the study of changing trends in prejudice, we see very interesting patterns. Uh, what you see here is uh, 
our research in the Greek Cypriot community first. We have a lot of data, especially from the Greek Cypriot community. And you see the percentage of people who have positive feelings for the other community, for Turkish Cypriots, and neutral feelings and negative feelings. So green is positive feelings. Um, gray is neutral feelings and red is negative feelings. And what you see here is that um, there is a, in the last 10 years a decreasing downward trend in negative feelings. And there is some, you know, some uh, change of positive uh, trend. In 2015, for example, when we had uh, the latest effort to resolve the problem, and we have the two leaders, Anastasiadis and Akinji, being in a very positive mood and spirit and uh, trying to solve the problem, we had more than 50% of the people who felt positively towards Turkish Cypriots. Then that with the Kramon Dana failure went somewhat down. And then again, now it's up. And the people who are positive uh, are twice the people who are negative today. In the Turkish Cypriot community, uh, again, you see this downward trend in negative feelings. And this is clearly related to the opening of the checkpoints. We have written a number of papers on this issue with Turkish Cypriot colleagues, both social psychologists like Hussein Chakal, who works at Kiel, uh, and Denise Yugel, who works um, in the United States, who is a sociologist. And we explore the role of contact in prejudice reduction. And I will say a few things about that more. But one of the major reasons you see here this downward trend in negative feelings towards the other community is exactly because of contact that was made possible since 2003. Now, uh, usually in our research, we also go into some more political questions, like whether people are ready to support a solution to the problem if we go in a new referendum. And here you see the trends in the Greek Cypriot community. Um, you see that uh, there is a changing trend, but generally in the last 10 years, you see that uh, the people who are ready to support a solution in a referendum are actually twice the number of the people who are ready to reject it. In the Turkish Cypriot community, uh, there is a, the opposite turn. In the last few years, um, people are becoming more ready to reject the plan in, instead of accepting it. And we can discuss whether this is due to the Crown Montana failure, which is largely attributed to Greek Cypriot, uh, the Greek Cypriot leaders, um, you know, um, not willingness to go for a solution. Uh, at least that's how it's discussed uh, as far as I'm aware in the Turkish Cypriot community. So there is might be an element of disappointment there uh, that, you know, feeling that Greek Cypriots don't want a solution. So if they don't want a solution, we are not also interested. So we can discuss more about that, but we see that there is a slight change in negative trend in the Turkish Cypriot community. Now, just to finish, uh, because I, I don't want to take uh, a lot of time. Um, I wanted to stress a bit more the role of contact. And as I said, since 2003, we have been involved in uh, more than 30 research projects with many colleagues. Most of them have been done in both communities in parallel, uh, in Turkish, in the Turkish Cypriot community, and in Greek, in the Greek Cypriot community, with largely representative sample surveys. And um, what you see here is just some statistical data uh, of the people who used to cross um, and you could see that just before the corona uh, pandemic we had a real surge in crossings and you see that we had around three million crossings every day every year sorry so that was really um, people people at that point were becoming very accustomed to crossing uh, across the line. And it was a very unfortunate event that we had the pandemic just at that point that, you know, uh, there was a normalization of crossing between the two communities. 
Um, of course, opportunities for contacts vary depending on the geographical location. For example, you see people here closer to Lima Pavos and Lima Sol that are far away from the middle in the UN buffer zone that have much less opportunities to meet members of the other community. And we can see that also plays a role because we find variations in the prejudice levels. So people usually in Limassol and Bafos are more prejudiced towards Turkish Cypriots. And probably one of the reasons is because they have less opportunities to come into contact with Turkish Cypriots. Uh, here is just a meta regression, which uh, every dot here is the result of one study. And the effect size of each study, uh, when it's below zero, indicates that the contact is reducing prejudice. And what you see here is that there is a very clear pattern that in both communities, we find that contact leads to the reduction of prejudice. So I'm just stressing that because sometimes we hear from politicians' arguments that go along this way. You know, opening the checkpoints was a mistake. Um, it's just normalizing partition and it's just making people, um, you know, legitimize in their head partition. But actually what you find here is that the people who have more contact, uh, they feel more ready to live again with the other community and they feel more trust towards the other community and they are actually more ready to support the solution. So the, the political argument that we sometimes hear is actually completely the opposite of what the empirical evidence here is uh, supporting. And this is just a structural equation modeling that shows how contact works. So the people who have more contact uh, have less threats, realistic group esteem threats and anxiety. Less threats means more positive attitudes, means more trust, and as I said earlier, more willingness to live together again with other communities. On the contrary, the people who adhere to these master narratives, and we measured that by taking sentences from textbooks and seeing whether people agree to this master narrative or not. So the more they agree with the master narrative, we found that the more threatened they feel, higher threats. So that leads to less trust, uh, more prejudice, and then less willingness to live together. So in the case of uh, the Greek Cypriot system, uh, it's actually tragic because uh, on the one hand, the official position is that we need to reunify Cyprus. But on the other hand, we see that the narrative that is actually propagated in the system is making people uh, want not to reunite Cyprus, but actually uh, live separately for Turkish Cypriots. So in that sense, one can be very critical of whether the policies implemented are aligned with the official purpose of actually reuniting Cyprus? And that's a very good question for discussion. And that's true, by the way, in both communities. The people who adhere also in the Turkey Cypriot community to the master narrative are also less likely to, to want to live again with Greek Cypriots. So, uh, I will just take five minutes and I finish. I just want to show some recent trends from recent research uh, that show the stance of Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots on some political ways to solve the problem. So, of course, one option is to just leave things as they are today, just continue with the status quo without solving the problem. And what do we see on that issue? we see that in the Greek Cypriot community, only in the last year, we have a sharp increase of people who reject the status quo. So they think that the situation is unsustainable, which aligns with the statements of the UN Secretary General, who reiterated a few times in the last three years that the status quo is actually unsustainable and needs to change. In the Turkish Cypriot community, as I said earlier, we have in the last years a somewhat worrying trend of more people accepting the status quo. Then if we go to the idea of a unitary state, which we know from research is usually the ideal of Greek Cypriots, but it's actually rejected by Turkish Cypriots. We see that this 
here refers to the views of Greek Cypriots is generally very high, the idea of unitary state. But as I said earlier, in Greek Cypriot is mostly rejected. If we go to the idea of um, two-state solution, which was recently discussed and was proposed by the Turkish Cypriot leadership and uh, Turkey recently at the Geneva meeting, we see that in the case of Greek Cypriots is uh, rejected by some about 80%, and that's a very steady finding in the last 10 years. In the case of Greek of Turkish Cypriots, there is an increasing turn um, percentage of people who accept the idea of a two-state solution. And uh, so up to here, we see the picture that you know the two communities have their ideals. For Greek Cypriots, this is the unitary state. For Turkish Cypriots, is a two-state. But both of these are rejected by the other community. So we go to the bizonal by communal federation which is the UN supported plan since 1977 and the basis on which UN uh, facilitated discussions have been taking place. And we see here some more promising findings because you see that um, in the last years, there is an increasing trend of Greek Cypriots who accept federation. Actually, if you add the percentage of people who think who are in favor of solution, and who can tolerate it in case needed, they are actually around 75% in the Greek Cypriot community. And in the case of the Turkish Cypriot community, if you add again the people who are in favor, 54%, and the people who can tolerate if necessary, actually again, we are around 75%, 71%. So there's a clear majority that can accept BBF, and that's very important politically because that is the only solution that, according to research, can be accepted by both communities. So I think I will leave it here. Um, I don't want to take more time, and we can discuss more during the discussion time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Harris. This was an um, excellent presentation. You updated us with all this um, new findings from the field. And uh, most importantly, it's like how people feel and expect uh, what their expectations are about the future. Um, I have some questions, but um, should we, um, well, maybe I'll, initiated if it's okay and if there's no um i'm sure people will ask uh later but um maybe i can um ask a quick question um well um <laughs> i mean you mentioned that um a greek cypriots um at some point um i think in uh, the, the current um currently more, change their views about sustaining the status quo. Um, why do you think this is? I mean, what's the reason for Greek Cypriots uh, change of view? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ishik. That's a very good question. Um, with um, our colleague, Novidos Loizidis and Hussein Chakal, we have written about this recently because it needs explanation. And it's actually this combination of findings uh, that needs explanation. On the one hand, you have more people rejecting the status quo. So that makes you wonder, okay, if they reject the situation as currently is, where are they moving to? <laughs> you know, what one might say, maybe they are becoming more accustomed to the idea of uh, two states. Maybe they become uh, more, uh, you know, accustomed to the idea of uh, federation. So what was the, where are they moving to? And the answer to this is that uh, they are not moving towards a two-state idea because we have also an increase in the people who reject the two-state solution idea. The people move towards federation. We have an increase in the people who support the idea of a federation. So the reason why we have this, I think, are actually at least Four reasons why this is happening. Uh, the first 
is that uh, we have uh, in the last years, um, after the Cram Montana failure, a realization uh, by many Greek Cypriots that the status quo is becoming unsustainable and changing in a way that is not in favor of Greek Cypriot interests. And why is that? That's because, you know, we have the issue of hydrocarbon. You know, um, Cyprus uh, had the claims to some areas in the Eastern Mediterranean. Then we had these um, conflicting views with Turkey. And uh, actually last year we came to the brink of war between Greece and Turkey. So this is making a lot of people very uh, insecure about this is going nowhere and it's actually escalating conflict. So that's one reason. The second reason is because as we have seen earlier, since 2003, we have the opening of the checkpoints and we had a lot of people who created friendships and contacts. So just to give you a number, um, around half of, of Turkish Cypriots state in research that they have a friend from the other community. And the corresponding percentage in Greek Cypriots is about one third, 30%. So you understand that many people created these close links and now that with the COVID crisis, uh, a lot of the checkpoints had to close for health reasons. A lot of people feel very exasperated and very, you know, um, a lot of suppressed um, constraint in their free movement and in having relationships with other community. And we have seen this very recently with some joint collective action uh, and protests uh, on the same day from both communities that were asking for a solution on the basis of federation and for the reopening of the checkpoints. So you can see that very clearly that this is a growing trend. The third one is the more Cypriocentric trend I discussed earlier, which creates a more inclusive form of identity and ethical horizon of thinking also about the other community and not just in communitarian terms on or with the wider idea of uh, the nation. Um, and also at the political level, uh, we have uh, AGEL, which is the left-wing party in the Greek Cypriot community. You know, in 2004, when we had the referendum, they supported no, but in, in the last 10 years, no, 15 years, 16 years, they have become very clear on their stance that they are supporting BBA, that they want to solve the problem as soon as possible. And I also, uh, there is a very clear stance from the other major party, which is the ruling party, VC, which is also taking a very clear stance in favor of BBF. Uh, I mean, even in the last three years after Cram Montana, even some of the so-called centrist parties, that some of them we used to express views against federation are actually today expressing uh, views that support federation, like Vigo, for example. So you have the political, which is very clearly supportive of, um, of federation. You have at the level of grassroots, these changes that I described, and you have the geopolitical, as I said earlier. So it's different levels, and I think all of them work towards the same direction of making Greek Cypriot realize that our real, um, the real decision we need to make is not between the ideal unitary state and federation, which is the compromise solution, but the real um, decision we need to make is between two states and federation. And we have seen that the vast majority of Greek Cypriots rejects two states. So, you know, even if going with um, prospect theory uh, in, in psychology, you know that if you have two options and the one is very negative, you go for the, you know, the, the least harmful of the two options. So I think that's the situation with Greek Cypriots. Um, thank you very much, Horus. These are, um, you know, uh, great. I mean, I now understand. Um, you it looks like we have a lot of um, questions. Uh, maybe uh, you mind moderating um, the 
discussion um, maybe you should take sure over. i guess we have the first question from martin barrett and he asked to read this question by himself so please mr barrett if you are here you can hi martin hi hi nice to see you <laughs> it's very good to see you. Thanks, Harris. Really interesting to hear this update. I've been following the situation in Cyprus for a long time now. I'm These days, I'm more interested in education rather than the social and developmental psychology of the situation there, or rather the application of the developmental and social psychology to education and how education can contribute to the solution of the problem. Now, you mentioned the two different education systems at the outset of your talk, and you homed in particularly on history education. Um, yes, and I'm, you know, I'm familiar with a lot of the work from round about 2006, seven, eight, and so on, that took place in Cyprus on history education. But I just wonder, are there other ways in which you think that education could be harnessed other than history education? Because my perception is there are lots of different ways in which education systems, if the political will was there within the education systems, in which education could actually make a great difference amongst younger, the, the younger generation. Now, one of the sets of findings, obviously, that you spoke about because you've spent so much time I'm researching this is the role of contact in reducing prejudice. And I just wonder, even under pandemic circumstances, do you think there's any mileage in the idea of, for example, arranging intergroup contact between school students virtually through the internet, online contact, uh, contact which you know, it can be very powerful in reducing prejudice if it's based upon cooperative activities, for example, collaborative learning projects that could be set up by schools, by teachers. You know, that's just one possibility that occurs to me based on what you've been talking about. But the second part of my question is, if education on both sides of, of, of the, the conflict were to, if education were to be harnessed in that kind of way, would there be significant kickback from the parents of the students within the schools, particularly those who have the strong ethno-nationalist orientation towards the situation? In other words, is this a practically feasible option given the feelings of parents within um, the two communities. So it, my question, it's a long question, sorry, but it's basically about the role of education and what you think might be possible, other than, of course, changing the narratives within history yeah. education. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Martin, because um, these are very crucial questions. And here I will uh, put my hat on <laughs> uh, of being a member of the Bicommunal Technical Committee of Education. So in 2015, uh, the two leaders, uh, back then it was Mustafa Kinji and Anastasiadis, they appointed uh, about 10 members from each community, um, academics, um, teachers, people who, you know, who, who are very much interested in education and in relation to confidence building measures. So there were social psychologists there as myself and my colleague, Turkey Cypriot colleague, uh, Chanel Husnu, uh, who works at the MU. And uh, we have thought a lot about this, the question that you just posed, and we have acted on it um, because since 2015, 16, when we started doing work, we created a number of proposals and we have actually read your own ideas with the Council of Europe and your material. And that, that thank you very much for that because that was very insightful. And uh, what was politically feasible to do, because you know what, whatever we propose needs to be approved by the two leaderships. So to get the political approval to be implemented in the educational system as a policy, so I think our major breakthrough, if you like, 
was to uh, initiate a contact scheme called the Imagine Program, which takes place at the Home for Cooperation. Uh, Ishik knows about the home. It's in the middle of Nicosia in the buffer zone. It's an educational center that was created by the Association for Historical Dialogue and Research, and uh, which is a bicommunal association dealing with issues of dialogue around history teaching. And one of its major projects was to build this uh, home for cooperation. I had a personal involvement in this, so I can talk about much more about that if you like uh, in the future. But the program now, uh, the program called Imagine, is that we bring students uh, both at the elementary level and gymnasium and lyceum uh, during teaching time, so official teaching time in the mornings, and they go for two hours at the home and they have this program, educational program, where they talk to each other and they play games, etc. And now with the COVID crisis, you had a very nice suggestion there, which we can go into a virtual mode and we are actually just doing that now. Now Imagine is being transformed into a virtual Imagine program. So thank you very much for the idea. Um, and if you have any other ideas, we would be more than happy to, you know, to listen to it. Okay, thank you very much, Harris. Um, wonderful talk. And I'll be very interested to learn more about what you're doing on the education front in the future. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Okay, our next question is from Tuche Kulic. So, Tuche, if you would like to read your question, um, you can open your microphone and ask by yourself, or otherwise, I can do this. I mean, generally, in our uh, yeah, okay, great. Yeah, I can read it. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Is it possible to change already established prejudices of people towards other community? Do you have other suggestions in addition to increasing contacts or changing historical textbooks between two communities? Yes, um, okay, I mean, I would say that two major things that can be done is contact, bring people into contact, either directly, and now that physically is not possible due to COVID, you know, we can do what we just discussed with Martin, some kind of virtual or indirect or vicarious forms of contact. And uh, my colleague at the, um, at the MU, Chanel Husnu, is working in the last years on the so-called imagined contact, which is, um, you know, when people think of having contact, and that actually prepares people to have direct contact. So that's one big chapter of doing things. The other is history teaching. And unfortunately, to come back to the work of the Bicommunal Technical Committee, despite the views of some of us that we needed to do something to change history textbooks, to revise the, the historical narrative, I'm afraid we didn't find the support from the leadership to do that. And I think the reason uh, why this is happening is because they are afraid of backlash effects. So, you know, people become very touchy when you start to talk about the revising history textbooks and changing their history, you know. People, especially nationalist people, have to tend to have a very ossified view and reified view of history. So any effort to change history textbooks for them is like changing their own and only view of history. So it's kind of an epistemological question here. Uh, they take it as an attack on their identity. So I guess my, this might be the reason why we have been asked not to change history textbooks or not to work on that issue. Although one might also say that, you know, politically, um, you would get reaction maybe from some parties that they feel that their political discourse is being fed by that master narrative. So in the case of Cyprus, you would find that right-wing parties in both communities, they tend to reiterate that kind of master narratives. And in that sense, maybe also some political parties. And in the case of Greek Cypriots, the church also was very vocal against the change of history textbooks in the past. I remember 
when my colleague, uh, Professor Andreas Dimitriou, uh, who, he, who is a social developmental psychologist, I'm sure Martin knows Andreas Dimitriou, when he was a, um, a minister of education during the previous government in 2000, from 2005 to 2000, um, sorry, 2003 to 2008. And he tried to change history textbooks in the context of a greater educational reform. He found a lot of resistance, not only from the church, but also from the trade unions of teachers who were um, mainly influenced by the right-wing parties. So you will see that, you know, it becomes very political. So, but the question of Duce, I think was, uh, what can we do beyond contact and history? So uh, one can think of uh, the role of the media, the role of Facebook, and we have published a paper on that. Um, beyond direct friendships, we found that people who use Facebook and interact over Facebook with members of the other community also reduce their prejudice and build trust. So. You know, nowadays social media is a very important part of our life and we need to think really hard about how we can use the media to co communicate information that deconstructs stereotypes about the other community. What do we do today actually is part of deconstructing stereotypes because people get informed about the views of people and, and they don't just wait to read in newspapers that usually manipulate the views of the other community just to promote the nationalist narrative. Uh, we have recently also published a paper on that with Maria Bramido, who is a, a communications expert. And what we have done is that we analyzed the way the editorials of two mainstream uh, newspapers in the Greek Cypriot community covered the negotiations leading up to Cram Montana. And what we have found is that they were very clearly using all the mechanisms of propaganda that Moscovici described in the second part of his book on psychoanalysis and its public. So, you know, you're using this, uh, the ways to undermine dialogue with alternative representations. So stigmatizing people as traitors uh, who want to find a solution. Uh, so there is much more to do in the area of media and journalism. This is something we have not touched upon, but it's really crucial because you need to know that in the Greek Cypriot community, um, almost all of the TV stations are against the solution, okay? And in the newspapers, uh, in the area of the uh, press, uh, published press, uh, print press, uh, the situation is only a bit better because you find at least two um, news outlets that are favor of the solution and the rest are again uh, against the solution. So asking about what else to be done, I would say that should be actually a priority beyond the work in the educational system, beyond the work on contact, uh, journalism and the media is, should be a major priority here. Thank you very much. Okay, we have the next question from Ishan Sojar. So, Ms. Sojar. Thank you, Yulia. Um, so it's a short but broad question, actually. Uh, I was wondering to what extent uh, Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot identity can complement each other. Yeah, well, complementing each other. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a difficult question. I guess I can start from the idea that Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots have both similarities and differences. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you go into the um, into the way we use the dialect, okay, we have a dialect which is for Greek Cypriots is a dialect of the um, of modern Greek, you know, of the of the official. Greek language as they is being spoken in Athens, for example, and, and the same for Turkish Cypriot. They have their own dialect, which is different of, of how it's spoken in Turkey. 
And if you go into studying the words used there, you will find that I think, if I remember correctly, you have around 3,000 words that are exactly the same in both dialects. If you're going to a study of, you know, dance, traditional dance on food, again, you will find a lot of similarities because you need to remember that, you know, the two communities used to live together for many, many years in the past. Uh, up to 1960, there were 114 mixed villages. And we have just published one research, it's now in press with some colleagues from uh, the University of Lausanne in, in Brussels, uh, where we studied the views of people who used to live in mixed villages, and we measured the level of contact they had in the village and the experience of um, traumatic events like conflict. So we measure both positive contact and negative influence from conflict. In the past, we measured similar views today, and we found some really interesting findings because through a multi-level analysis, we were, we were able to show that the people who don't have so much contact today, uh, that kind of gap is filled by past contact and the other way around, the people who had past contact um, but don't have contact today, they keep having low levels of prejudice today because they had positive contact in the past. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, past and present in this kind of areas where you had uh, mixing in the past are still very relevant. And that kind of uh, memory of cohabitation is a very useful resource for people to draw for in the future. Uh, so asking about complementarity of identities, uh, I guess we can talk today about, uh, you know, multiple identities, that people have multiple identities. We are both Cypriot and we have some heritage from so-called motherlands. That's a reality, you know, and in that sense, we can be more rich in thinking about who a Cypriot is. A Cypriot is somebody who can uh, learn both Greek and Turkish if they like. They can actually be in the middle of East and West of two religions, you know. I, if that is what you mean, yeah. I mean, that's something that we need to, to think uh, with broader horizons and understand that being Cypriot is actually a much richer heritage of being either just Greek or Turkish. Thank you. And we have a next question from Steve Comer. So if you are here, you can ask a question personally. Thank you, yes. Uh, um, Harris, you mentioned quite a bit earlier on about the Turkish Cypriots being one of the most secular communities in, in the world, and, and that, that's certainly my experience too. Um, but I want to ask about the role of religion in, in, in the Greek Cypriot community. I, I live near three um, Orthodox churches in, in Cyprus. Um, and anecdot this is anecdotal, but what I see is that the majority of those attending are older people. Um, they're people my age and older. Um, so uh, the, the question I, I, I'm asking really is, particularly in, in comparison with, with Turkish Cypriots, what is the influence of the Orthodox Church now, and, and particularly the political influence, uh, and has that changed in the last 10 years, the last 20 years? Um, you know, we're now nearly, we're what, 17 years post, post Anan. Um, so I wonder whether that, that influence, the political influence of the church, and, uh, and where is it now compared to where it was there was a, a last a, a vote on the settlement? Yes, Steve. Thank you very much for this. Actually, you, <laughs> you are very lucky in the sense that I was preparing this morning a, a slide, PowerPoint slide, for another presentation that we are giving tomorrow. By the way, wh whoever is interested, just uh, email me. And I will arrange so you can take part in this. I'm writing my uh, email here in chat because tomorrow we are organizing a, a similar discussion with colleagues for social psychologists, Chanel Husnu, who's, 
Hussein Chakal and Maria Ioannou. Um, it's a discussion organized by UCN, and we are discussing my own findings and their own findings and joint work we have done together. And as I was preparing for that presentation, I had a point that refers to, you know, religiosity and how people, how often they attend the church or the mosque uh, in the north. And I have some, found some really interesting findings. First, you need to know that uh, religiosity and attending church and the mosque is negatively related with the views about the other community. So the more people attend the mosque and the church, the more negative they become towards the other community. And that's true for both communities. So that makes you wonder about the messages they got in this place. But then there is the question of changing trends. So are people becoming more or less religious? And we have some evidence of that. I will just share this PowerPoint slide. Here it is. Because we are discussing misconceptions tomorrow and how research findings can actually deconstruct misconceptions. You know, we, we have a misconception that the, the youth hate the other community. Uh, we have a, a misconception that, you know, people are very religious and they become even more religious with time passing. And yeah, as you see here, the finding is actually uh, in the opposite direction, that people are uh, around 50% of Turkish Cypriots never go to the mosque. And in the age group 18 to 35, this is becoming bigger. So that shows that with time, you have more people becoming more secular, not more religious. And it's the similar situation in the Greek Cypriot community. Of course, in the Greek Cypriot community, only 15% don't go to church because Greek Cypriots are much more religious compared to Turkish Cypriots. But the trend is the same. You see that 15% um, never go to church generally. And if you center on youth, this is higher. It's 22%. So, you know, the, old, the younger generation are becoming more secular in both communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we continue with the next speaker, uh, with the next uh, question to our speaker from Lara Schroeter. Um, so I hope that I read this name correct. Yes, thank you. That's, that's correct. Um, yeah, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned that you measure the level of forgiveness and trust. And I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on how you measured these things because they can be quite intangible and quite vague for many people. Mm -hmm. And um, the second question would be what work is being done in these separate communities and intercommunally to build trust and forgiveness? And what level is this being done? Is this grassroots faith communities or large NGOs, um, international NGOs, et cetera? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lara. Yeah, uh, trust usually is measured by some, you know, mainstream uh, social psychological measures, like um, to what extent do you trust Turkish Cypriots when they say that they love Cyprus? So that's one item that you usually use. And, you know, people say, um, I guess we have some technical issues. Um, I hope that and Paris I underrate oh, people, but not towards politicians. And uh, yes, yeah, so. can you hear me? Yeah, now right now you are back. It was like frozen screen, so yeah, right okay. now we can hear. Okay, yeah, I was saying that um, one might want to ask this question about both lay people and politicians. And because we usually find that people trust more people, but they tend to trust much less the politicians. 
So that, that's a, also a finding. Um, and but I, I know that trust is sometimes difficult to 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 measure, and it's also difficult to build because uh, prejudice changes much much more easily. But we have found throughout all these years that usually trust is lower, and it usually changes much less compared to feelings. Uh, so there is a, that's a good question. Now forgiveness, we have not measured so much level of forgiveness because i remember uh, in uh, some of the first studies we tried to do on forgiveness that people were not really sure how to to approach the issue so they were asking you are asking me whether i'm ready to forgive but who do you want me to forgive because when i go into an analysis of how we came to this point I can think of politicians, I can think of uh, foreign powers beyond outside Cyprus, I can think of nationalists within Cyprus. So when you ask me to forgive, who, who am I to forgive? So actually forgiveness is much more difficult compared to trust. And uh, maybe that was the reason why we did not devote much of our research on forgiveness. Um, but I, I'm sure it's a very important topic, and it also touches upon the role of church. And because in your second part of your question, you are asking whether you have initiatives regarding faith communities. And there are some initiatives um, facilitated by the Swedish embassy, some interfaith dialogue, which is facilitated by the Swedish embassy where they try to bring representatives of the church and the FKAF and not the FKAF, I mean, the, uh, some imams from the Muslim community. But th that's interesting because usually Turkish Cypriots don't take this very, <laughs> very in a positive way, because as I said earlier, in their more secular view, they don't want the religion to be involved in politics. So sometimes we get a reaction you know, in the Turkey Cypriot community, we don't have the church intervening in politics. Why do you want to involve them in politics in that way? So just keep them out, you know. <laughs> so that's an interesting uh, um, asymmetry in terms of faith dialogue in Cyprus. But if you ask me, yeah, I mean, there are religious people. And instead of having the church and the religion separating people, yeah, why not promote uh, interfaith dialogue? I think it's something that needs to be done anyway. And then there are some initiatives. Uh, you also asked about NGOs. Um, of course, we have local NGOs. We have a network of NGOs that are connected like the Anna Lind Foundation in terms of the Mediterranean. We have international NGOs that came to work in Cyprus like a, uh, International uh, Center for Transitional Justice. We had the elders who visited Cyprus, uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, Desmond Dudu, and uh, Brahami at some point. Um, we have NGOs working on issues of environment, on issues of history teaching, uh, on women's issues, uh, feministic movement, we have a lot of a lot of NGOs, and usually people who come from other countries, they actually say, "Oh, you have a quite vibrant, by communal civil society here." Uh, you know, okay. I mean, from research, we know about the percentage involved in this kind of NGOs. It's about ten to fifteen percent. Now, I don't know in compare to other post-conflict settings or frozen conflicts, what the percentage usually is there. But I guess it's kind of a critical mass because you, you can see the influence of these uh, NGOs. Like recently, when I described the collective uh, joint action of protest at the same time in both parts of Nicosia for federation and for opening the checkpoints, uh, this, this was obviously initiated and organized by a lot of by communal NGOs. 
So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, they, they make a difference and it's very clear that they can actually um, make an impact. Uh, I have very small question and very simple, I hope, compared to the, the other, I guess. Uh, you mentioned that checkpoints were opened and uh, people started traveling be before these uh, pandemic uh, cases. Uh, what is the reason of traveling? I mean, is it tourism or something else? And who travels more? I mean, uh, it's uh, Turkish side goes uh, to uh, south or south goes to north. I mean, which one is more traveling, let's say, to the other side? Is there any data like that? Because I'm just wondering. Yeah, well, that's a very good uh, question. Um, usually, there is a higher percentage of Turkish Cypriots crossing to the south compared to Greek Cypriots crossing to the north. And one might ask, why is this happening? And the reason why this is happening is because some political parties in the south, in the Greek Cypriot community, um, stigmatized contact from day one when we had the opening of the checkpoint. So what do I mean by stigmatized? They try to make the argument that in the north we have an internationally non-recognized state. So if you cross there and you make uh, economic transactions and you pay people and you buy things and you show IDs or passports to pass, then you somehow, somehow give legitimacy to that non-internationally recognized state. So unfortunately, uh, that kind of argument influenced a number of people because we know from research even today that one third, 30% of Greek Cypriots actually never crossed to the north. So one in three never crossed to the north. And when you ask them, why don't you cross there? They usually give three or four reasons for not crossing. One is if they are internally displaced people, they might say, I don't want to visit my home as a tourist. And you understand this is kind of an emotional reaction. Second is you get, sometimes you get this discourse of the politicians of these center parties that objected the opening from day one. And you know, I don't, I don't want to, to support economically or give any legitimacy, moral legitimacy to a non-recognized state. And some people, especially sometimes younger people say, why should I go there? I, I, I'm, you know, if they are, especially if they are not internally displaced and they don't have properties, they don't even see the reason. And, and the educational system, unfortunately, uh, has a, a role to play here because as I said earlier, there is the need to help the younger generation to meet each other from the two communities, as the Imagine program is doing now. And you know, if you see a lot of people not interested in visiting and making friendships and meeting, then it tells you something about the educational system. But you know that the educational system is not doing enough to promote this contact. So um, yeah, there, there is much more to be done to promote crossings of Greek Cypriots in the north and to facilitate um, much more contacts. But, then, but just to close this point, I mean, in the Turkish Cypriot community, there is no such a stigma, you know, of crossing to the south. Um, because it has not become a political issue. They cross well, mostly to just to, as a tourist to travel to see. I mean, um, any... yeah. Usually, when you ask Turkish Cypriots why do you cross, they would say, "I want to go shopping. I want mm -hmm. to go visit, you know, Trodos Mountain, uh, especially when it's winter and you have uh, snow. It's something that is difficult to find uh, in the northern part of Cyprus. Um, but usually, it's for shopping and for meeting friends." As I said earlier, half of Turkish Cypriots now have friends in the other community. So these are the major three reasons, visiting places, going shopping and visiting friends.
and, and the people, of course, who are involved in bicommunal activities and in NGOs who, you know, who do this on a more regular basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And by the way, when they are communicating, uh, which language do they use? English. English, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so both sides must speak very, very well English. So this is good, actually. Okay, and we have um, we have question from Turgut Tunjel. Thank you very much. Uh, you hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in your presentation, you you said, I mean, depending on your data, you said probably the most feasible solution is is is, is a federative solution, right? Um, this may be the you know, most workable solution, but I think there is a trick about that, and I wonder if you made any research on that. So as this. It, there's a saying, it says evil is in the details, right? So, so people say, okay, federative solution might be possible. We might we may say, okay, to the federative solution. So this part is okay. But I think the real problem is about the federative solution is the structure of, of, the, of the federation, of the uh, would-be federation. For instance, I mean, the structure of the polity of this federative state, uh, which powers or authorities will belong to whom? You know, this kind of, uh, a lot of, I mean, this kind of questions. And I think these are very important. And uh, I mean, I, I'm thinking that if you begin to think in detail, uh, the details of, of the federative uh, structure, then people may start to rethink about their um, support to this kind of a solution. Do you have any data about that or any observations? I mean, when you go into the details about the federative uh, solution, uh, do the attitudes of people change? You know, um, could you please, I mean, if you have any observations or data about yeah. that? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, well, that's, um, that's a very good question, thank you. Uh, actually, in some recent research with Neofitos Loisiris and Ishik, uh, we explored uh, using this method, which was first um, it was first uh, applied in marketing, and it's called the conjoined analysis. And we applied that method in the diaspora and in the local communities, in both communities. And this is this method is very important for going into the details of what you just try to, to understand. Uh, and why is that? Because let me first explain a bit what the conjoint method is. Um, let's say I want to develop a new car, okay? And I have many, many options. So from the color of the car to the kind of, uh, of um, shape or the, the power horse, you know, the, the power of the car. And obviously there are many combinations that I can create as a producer. And I want to know if I go to sell my future product, what kind of dimensions of that new product people will like and dislike. So I form my product. So we applied this idea in the Guterres package, which is the package of a solution that was offered in Cram Montana three years ago from UN Secretary General Guterres, where he tried to create a form of give and take. So he thought for Greek Cypriots, it's important to uh, change the guarantees by Greece, Turkey, and uh, the UK. For Turkish Cypriots, it's important to get political equality in federation. So there needs to be a give and take there. That was the basic equation. And then you have other dimensions, which was about uh, how many, what kind of ratio of new citizens we will accept from Greece and Turkey, what kind of arrangements we will have in the constitution, in the high court, what kind of executive we will have in the federal executive, et cetera, et cetera. So you have different dimensions and you have different options. The, the 
combinations of that are in the in the hundreds, in the thousands. Okay, but in the conjoint method, you give the respondent each time one particular package, one selection of these many options, and you give them in front of them two packages, and you say. If you could select one of these two packages, which one would you choose? And they say, okay, I choose A and not B. And then you do the same again. And then you do the same again. You do that four or five times. And then you run the algorithm and that allows you to actually find out which dimension is most important for each community, which is the more acceptable package for each community, and if there is a package that can actually get the majority in a possible referendum in both communities. And we presented these findings uh, at the UN uh, last year because we managed to find at least two or three packages of very specific detailed packages that could actually be accepted in uh, the case of a referendum in both communities. So I think uh, the answer to to that is that, yes, the Cyprus problem is solvable, even if you go into the details. And if you are interested in that, please send me an email and we can send you the paper because it's going to be published very soon and, and a relevant presentation that we have already done last year. Maybe we should, um, Harris, this could be a, um, like, if I'm not sure if there's any more question, a good way to um, kind of like close close the um, close the evening off to um, we um, first of all I wish like someone explain me or maybe you should have explained me um, the conjoint analysis with this analogy before because it took me uh, a while to understand <laughs> what we were doing but anyways I think it was uh, really um, really we should all so um, um, announced that we have this um, first large end survey among diaspora uh, Cypriots, uh, both Turkish and um, Greek uh, living in the UK. Um, this was um, due to a um, uh, British Academy Newton grant. Um, so that their support was um, really um, important. And so there too, uh, we work as a team and hopefully we'll um, have a uh, uh, Professor Saltis here in Ankara, I think, I mean, hopefully if things get better uh, this year or early 2022, um, we'll have an event uh, hopefully uh, in Ankara and we'll host uh, Professor Saltis here and um, maybe something in um, London as well in the UK because the findings are, and I'm kind of like, I think the findings will be also very interesting of the diaspora as, a, as a part, I mean, in comparison with the uh, locals and even alone because, you know, diasporas are usually known to be more pro status quo, but I think our findings could be a little uh, different than um, this general uh, findings so yeah looking forward to that also <laughs> yep. okay so if there so is no more sure. questions i guess we can finish and thank you very much for joining us and sharing your wonderful presentation and your, your interesting thoughts so we are looking forward to see you on the our next seminars and uh, um, i guess you will uh, get the um, uh, program of uh, the next seminars in your email. So hope to see all of you in our next seminars. Uh, we will keep you updated. So thank you very much and see you. I'm I'm closing. Thank you very much. Bye.